following is a presentation of the Fairfax Network. Pop-up books are also known as movable books. Pages spring, bounce, pop, and coil with every push, pull, and tab. Carefully, very carefully, paper engineers such as Robert Sabuda create parallel folds, angle folds, wheels, and other mechanisms so pages pop up and engage the reader. Now, from the Fairfax Network, let's meet your host, Della Kidd, and paper engineer, author, and illustrator, Robert Sabuda. Welcome to the MTA studio, home of Meet the Author. As a teacher and a mom, I know firsthand that pop-up books don't last too long in the wrong hands. Pop-up books are more fragile than most publications, but more and more, movable books are appearing in home and school libraries, thanks in part to my guest, Robert Sabuda. Thanks so much for stopping by today, Robert, to share your books and to answer some questions from your fans. Thank you for inviting me. Robert, you call yourself a paper engineer. Now, some folks watching might not be familiar with that. Could you explain what a paper engineer is? Well, the term paper engineer is really just a fancy word for somebody who makes pop-ups. Um, I make pop-ups from paper, and I like to fold, and I like to cut, and I like to glue things. Sometimes I make a mess but I like to make a pop-up at the end. So that's really what a paper engineer does, is just fold paper to make pop-ups. When you're working on a pop-up book, what comes first, the words or the engineering? Uh, well, with most books, the words do come first, and that's true for a pop-up book as well. You have to get the story laid out in your mind. You have to know what the exciting parts are going to be and, of course, how it's going to end. After that's finished, I do start to make all the pop-ups, slowly building different models, making some that work, and making plenty that don't work. So there's a lot of trial and error. A lot of trial and error, yes. I have a question from Alex. He's 10 years old, and his question was, did you want to make pop-ups when you were a kid? I did. I've always <laughs> been an artist. All of my teachers knew going through elementary school that Robert Sabuda, he's going to be an artist someday. So when I first discovered bookmaking, I thought, aha, if you can put something in the book and open it up, it could possibly pop up. So I've always been making books and pop-ups. To those of you just popping in, I'm talking to Robert Sabuda, paper engineer of a commemorative pop-up of The Wizard of Oz. He is also author and illustrator of the Cookie Count book and co-author of Young Naturalist's pop-up handbook on butterflies and its companion, The Young Naturalist's Handbook on Beetles. In just a moment, we'll share an excerpt of a tape Robert made that shows how his books are printed in the South American country of Ecuador. And when we return, we'll learn how to make pop-ups at the workshop. We'll take your calls at 1-800-231-6359. But first, let's go to the videotape. I'm at one of the printing plants of Car Graphics, a division of Carvajal, a major publishing and manufacturing company here in Ecuador and Colombia. They print lots of things here at the plant, especially my pop-up book. Now, one of the most interesting things about a pop-up book is that each book is printed from just one or two very large sheets of paper. The sheet of paper is printed on both sides because sometimes you can see both sides of a pop-up. Now the next step, of course, is to get all the pieces cut out of this large sheet. Let's go take a look. Here in the die making room, each pop-up has its very own die created. Not like a die fabric. These dies are just like cookie cutters. But instead of cutting cookie dough, they cut paper. Very thin strips of metal are inserted into a handheld die and pounded back and forth until they're in the exact same shape as the cookie cutters. So if we bring in the printed sheet, you can begin to see how this is going to work. 
the square areas of the die here match perfectly with the square areas on the printed sheet. And all the round, unusual shapes here on the die will also cut out these unusual shapes of the characters. The large die we just saw being made in the other room is secured to the bottom of this large metal plate and then pushed into our die press. At one end of the die press, the pre-printed sheets are stacked up and then one at a time roll down this ramp into this area where the die presses against each one and cuts out all the pop-up pieces. The die-cutted sheet comes out of the other end of the press looking just like this. And now you can see our pop-up pieces are ready to be punched out and assembled into a finished book. The die-cut sheets are driven three hours from Quito to Ibarra. Here at this car graphics plant, these sheets will be hand-assembled into finished pop-up books. The large printed and die-cut sheets are brought here to the scrapping room. Rubber mallets, like this one, are used to pound all the pop-up pieces out of the sheets. Now, some of the pop-up pieces are very small and detailed. Handmade tools, much like a screwdriver, are used to help punch out the tiny pieces of paper. Now that all the pieces are punched out, they're ready to be hand-assembled into a finished pop-up. Each assembler folds and glues just one portion of the pop. The glue bottle is narrow, so it can be held in one hand without having to put it down. This way, the process of making pop-ups goes much faster. Now, fast is important when making a pop-up, but not nearly as important as the quality. Welcome back. We're at the workshop now. Robert, thanks so much for sharing such a cool video with us. I didn't know there were so many craftspeople involved with making a pop-up book. There are. One of the great things about pop-ups is it goes from my hand designing it to their hands putting it together to your hands enjoying it. Well, I can't help but notice that you brought a lot of your tools with you. Yes, I did. Would you show us how to make a pop-up? Yes, I will. All right. Um, the first thing I do is I take a piece of regular card stock. Um, this is from an office supply store. Or if you prefer, you can use construction paper. Colored construction paper is fine. And I fold it in half like a card, using my fingers and my thumbs to crease it. Don't forget that your fingers and your thumbs are great tools to work with. For this particular pop-up, you need something to draw with at the beginning. And I will use a marker. You can use a pencil. You can use a pen. That's fine and I draw one black line right down the center. Doesn't matter how tall it is, it's alright if it's a little bit wiggly, it doesn't have to be perfect. Sometimes things in life aren't perfect and that's okay. Take a scissor and cut right along your black line and then fold the area that you just cut back into two triangles. Again, these don't have to be perfect. You know the pop-up is going to be good on the inside as long as you make some nice creases. The reason why you crease the cardstock is to loosen the fibers in it and make it kind of flexible. So after you fold it, you put it back to where it was, make it kind of wiggly, make sure it wiggles. Then you open it up like a tent, open your card up like a tent, and then you push what was on the outside to the inside and close it. So you can see the triangle that I just cut and folded on the outside is now on the inside. And you do that to the other side as well. You push that one to the inside and close it shut. So with just one line, cutting one line, you get the beginnings of a very simple mouth. You get a mouth that moves big and wide. But of course, for this kind of pop-up, I want my mouth to have some eyeballs. One of the great things about this kind of pop-up, the mouth pop-up, is that you can make mini versions of it. So I'll close my mouth pop-up up, I'll shut it again, and before, I drew the line from the fold that was at the bottom. Well, now these pieces on the inside have folds here. So I'm going to draw a line against this fold. We're going to make little teeny weeny weeny teeny eyes. So again, I make just one black line. And we're going to cut through both sides. We need two eyeballs. What good's a mouth without just one eyeball? We'll have two. So I cut through both sides. And just like last time, I folded it back into triangles. I'm going to fold these back into little triangles too. This will be one eyeball. Nice little triangles. That's one eye. We'll turn it over and we'll make two eyeballs. That's two. Crease them, make them flexible, nice and wiggly. Put them back to where they were. Turn it over. Put it back to where it was. Open it up like a tent. I open it up like a tent. And I push those little triangles to the inside too. This will be one side and we'll close this shut. 
and this will be the other side, and we'll close this shut too. Could we pause here for a moment? Sure. Because I have Sebastian waiting to ask you a, a oh, question. Oh, he's got a good question. Yes, Go ahead. Do. Hi, Sebastian. What is your question for Mr. Sabuda? Hi. Um, where did you learn how to draw? Where did I learn how to draw? I always had a sketchbook with me when I was a kid, and whether I went to school, or whether it was after school, or on the weekends, I was always drawing stuff. I grew up in the country in Michigan, so I would draw trees, and I went fishing with my dad, so I would draw fish. So a lot of drawings that I did, I taught myself how to draw, the same way a lot of artists teach themselves to draw. Thanks for your question, Sebastian. Okay, go ahead. I can't wait to see how So, this we can tell this is going to be a big pop-up because there's nothing really left on the outside. Everything's been pushed through to the inside. So now when we open it, we not only have a mouth, but we have eyeballs as well. You get some eyeballs on the inside too. Now a lot of my pop-ups and my pop-up books are white, but of course you can add colors to yours as well. Um, I can use markers or crayons or colored pencils, but one thing you shouldn't use when you're making a pop-up is paint. Why? Because if you use paint, the pop-up will stick together and that will definitely be a disaster. So I use a marker to color my pop-ups. This looks like it could use some green, so I'll add some green to it. What could it possibly be? Could it be a frog? Yes, I'm sure I hear some of you saying, it should be a frog. <laughs> what else could it be? It could be a toad. Maybe it could be a toad. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, it could be an alligator. Maybe an alligator or even a dragon, but I don't have time to make a dragon today. We're going to make something green that's in the air that I've always loved. And we'll put a hand on this side. Any ideas what people think it's going to be yet? Hmm, I don't know. Let's put some flying saucers up here and a flying saucer up here and wait for it to dry. Sometimes you got to blow on your stuff if it's, if it's marker so it dries. Close it up tight, close it up tight, and it becomes an alien. Ooh. <laughs> and one of the great things about this too is, if you didn't want to draw all around it, you could cut the edges into a circle and you could make it into a mask. So it could be a mask pop-up too. Well, you know, for people who are watching that have never made a pop-up, maybe it would be helpful for you to tell us what happened when you tried to make your first pop-up. When I tried to make my first pop-up, it didn't pop up. So, so don't give up. Don't give okay. up. I know I made it look very easy here, but I've had a lot of practice making pop-ups. So just like anything in life, if you're working on a hard project or you're working on a special drawing, mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't work out the way you want it to the first time, but you keep going and eventually you'll be successful. Okay. We have another call coming in. Hi, what is your name and what is your question for Mr. Sabuda? How did you get the paper to look like papyrus in the book about King Tut. Ah, that's a very good question. How did I get the paper to look like papyrus? Well, for those of you who know anything about papyrus, it's made from a plant and it's cut from a reed and it's pounded and it's flattened down and woven together to make a piece of paper. The reason why it looks like papyrus is because it actually is papyrus. As a matter of fact, we're looking at uh, one of the pictures from your Tutankhamun's Commons gift. There Could you, you talk it. to us a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Um, I painted the colors on the papyrus first. I would add the orange and add the white and add the blue, painting with paints directly on the papyrus. Then all the black area you see there is cut paper. I can t you can probably tell from my books that I love to work with paper. So all the black lines you see there, it's not marker, it's not pencil, it's not pen, it's cut paper. It looks like a piece of lace when you hold it up. And then I very, very carefully glue it down on top of the painted piece of papyrus. That was a great question. Very good. Another question that's been asked, um, could you tell us, is do you need to have math to be able to make a pop-up oh, book? Well, that's <laughs> actually I'm a very bad mathematician. Mm -hmm. So for everybody who isn't good in math, mm -hmm. they don't have to think they have to be good to make a pop-up. Mm -hmm. um, no, a lot of making pop-ups is really sort of seeing how the pop-up works and trial and error and experimenting. Sometimes you have to be very specific in a pop-up and the measurements have to be precise, but not always, not for simple pop-ups. You don't need a lot of math. Um, in one of my books here from The Wizard of Oz, when you open the pop-up for the Emerald City, it looks really fantastic and it shines and things are big. But really, all the pop-ups, if I hold it to you, if you look at it from overhead, you can see that the pop-ups are really just squares. Oh, look at that. We have They're a just lot. squares. Like little angles squares and rectangles. Different angles and rectangles, Certainly. but still very, very simple math. So for a pop-up, you don't have to be a great mathematician. You just have to be able to see what you want. 
Well, before your books are printed, do you make a full-scale example of what you're expecting it to turn out to be? I do. I make it in completely white. I don't use any color. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those samples don't work, and I'll have to make it five times or ten times, even twenty times, just to make sure that every single pop-up inside will work. We have a call from Trey. Hi, Trey. What is your question for Mr. Sabuda? I'd like to know, what was your favorite book you illustrated? What was my favorite book mm. that I illustrated? That is a very hard question. I'm sure that you make drawings or have special projects that are your favorites. And I think my favorite book is usually the one that I'm working on at the moment. Right now, for, for next year, I'm working on Alice in Wonderland. I'm sure a lot of you know Alice in Wonderland. And I'm working in my studio, making the pop-ups and putting the color on. So right now, that's my favorite book that I'm working on. Thanks for calling, Trey. Does it get frustrating make a pop, making a pop-up book? It can get frustrating sometimes because it takes a long time. Um, when I'll be speaking with kids in schools or libraries, they'll mm -hmm. ask, how long does it take to make a pop-up? And I ask them how long they think it would take me to make a pop-up book. And they're surprised to hear that it can take up to a year. So it can wow. take an entire school year to make one book. Would you say that um, the pop-up book art is more complex than your drawing because you use uh, both with your illustrations. Yes, I do. Um, making a pop-up book is more challenging because in a regular picture book, you can pretty much make the pictures be anything you want. You can draw anything you want, you can paint anything you want or color it, but with the pop-up book there's that one extra mm -hmm. element. You have to be able to put things in the pop-up that not only pop up, mm -hmm. but they have to pop shut. With a regular picture book you can just turn the page, but mm -hmm. with a pop-up book everything has to be able to go back inside when you're finished. Okay. Students publish stories in many different formats, including pop-ups. MTA reporter Jeff Clark has this story. Pre-writing, drafting, and revising are part of the writing process. For these students at Bailey's Elementary for Science and Technology, it's standard procedure. What isn't so standard is how these fourth graders are publishing their work. For page five and six, we could do like Robert Sabuda did. He took right here and did an outline. Inspired by the movable books of Robert Sabuda, students keep journals on page construction. And for that and this, I used strings so when it opened, and it popped up. And write detailed, informative text about the life cycle of plants. The hypocotyl spreads the sepal, which protects the flower and the leaves. This is what we needed because the whole class has to kind of see the flow of the book. With guidance from teacher Alan Curran, students are preparing a large, interactive book that will include plant facts and student experiments. Eventually, the publication will be part of a school-wide museum exhibition. But why did these students choose a pop-up format? You might think it's a regular book, but it'll pop out at you, so then you'll want to look at it more because if you have regular drawings, like, oh, it's just that, just leave it behind. Students publish in a variety of ways. Stories can be published on the web or formatted to fold and flip on all kinds of paper. Publishing a story may be the last stop in the writing process, but sometimes it can be the most memorable. For Meet the Author, this is Jeff. Back to you, Mrs. Kidd. Thank you, Jeff. What great publishing tips for teachers, parents, and kids. Robert, you've brought along a lot of things here besides your tools. I see you've lots of books, and some of them look very old. They are. Without well, sharing them with us. <laughs> I actually collect pop-up books. Oh, okay. That's one of my favorite hobbies, because, of course, I make them. I want to know where they come from. I think that history is an important part of the book world, so I enjoy the history of pop-up books as well. Um, one that I brought here today, the pop-up Mother Goose, is from the 1920s. This is from the 1920s, and it's one of the, the earliest actual pop-up books where the pop-up would be three-dimensional. You would open the page, and then something would actually pop up on the inside. Oh, here we have Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> and a lot of these books were kind of fragile because it was sort of a new innovation to have an actual pop-up, something that was three-dimensional. And of course, these kinds of books were really loved by, by children and adults, so they may not be in the best condition, but fortunately, I'm able to get some that I really enjoy. Yeah, these look like they're in very good condition. They've been well cared for. They are, and I take very good care of them now, too. <laughs> um, the next one I have is actually called a tunnel book, and these were very popular in the 1800s. This one is from 1851, and it's a, an exhibition that took place in London. It's very large, and you actually look through the inside of it. So we're going to open it oh, up right. here, sort of long. mind if I help you? Yes, please. Right. There's the front. Okay, 
It's very long. It's about two feet long. Oh and my it's gosh. Little, little pieces of paper all separately put together. And it's held together by silk. This is a, a very old tradition of boxes called peep shows that you used to be able to go up to and look in a small hole and see something on the inside mm -hmm. and, and pay a penny. Yeah, I see there's a very small hole right in the very A very of tiny this. hole and there's many, many different plates of different scenes of this particular exhibition. One of the great things about this type of book, this tunnel book, is that all of them were painted by hand. So when there's color in them, somebody took a brush and mm -hmm. watercolored all the little images inside each plate. That's fascinating. It's one of the best, one of the greatest ones that I have. Yeah. All right, so let's close this one and as up. as you're doing that, we're going to take another phone call. Sounds good. Hi, what's your question today for Mr. Sabuda? Hello, do you have a question? Why did you draw the love that moved the mountain in the paper dragon? And the Paper Dragon. The Paper Dragon is one of my favorite books. Why? Because of course it's about an artist, and I am an artist. Um, that book is also made with paper. What I did was I put watercolor paper onto tissue paper and cut out all the different pieces. I cut out mountains, and I cut out the dragon, and I cut out the fire, and then I would glue that onto a background piece of paper. One of the great things about um, creating art for a book like that is I can sort of shuffle things around, kind of like sort of like a puzzle, and see where things are going to look best before I glue each one down. That's a great question. Could you share some more of your antiques with us? I know you have a few more things here. I do. I have a couple more. This is one of my favorite books. Um, this may not necessarily be for young people, but I still think it's quite funny. It's called Mimical Ladies and Gentlemen, and I'm sure a lot of, um, a lot of the readers out there have seen pop-up books or movable books that have tabs on the back of them. You pull a little tab and something happens. So this I found a few years ago, and if you look at the back side of these little teeny cards, there's a tab on the back of it. And when you move the tab back and forth, the person looks like they're snoring. I absolutely love these. And these little cards, these were painted by hand too. And of course, it wasn't just men. We have women here blowing their noses. <laughs> so of course, this was before there was television or radio, so people would sit around at night with their kids and make up stories about the different kinds of adventures and jokey things that these people could do. How old are these cards? These particular cards are from 1825. Oh my gosh. This is about the same time that paper dolls became very popular and people were interested in having little figures of people made out of paper that they could play with. And this is a technique we could use a lot in our artwork today. Yes, with very much projects so. Projects in our That's classrooms. That's right. Lots of costumes, lots of Certainly. interesting decorations you can put on them. I see you've got several other books that, that you have here and I, I would love for you to, to share them with look. us. Well, this is one of my favorite books. If it's one thing you learn about Robert Sabuda today, it's that Robert Sabuda likes sweets. Mm. He especially likes to have cookies. When I was a boy, my mother made the best cookies I'd ever had. So I knew at one point I was going to make a pop-up book about cookies, which of course is Cookie Count. My favorite spread in this um, book is the last page which is the gingerbread house. That makes me hungry to look now, at it. Now, <laughs> I, I want everyone out there to realize this didn't just take me a few minutes to make. A pop-up like this is not simple and will take me about three weeks, four weeks, a month, sometimes a month and a half to be able to develop. But I really have to come up with the idea in my mind first of exactly what I want. Some of the best pop-ups are pop-ups that are objects. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking of making a pop-up, you have to think, what is a good object that I can make? Is it going to be a house, or is it going to be a tree, or is it going to be a cat? Because those are usually the best kinds of pop-ups. So I knew for Cookie Count, one of the things I really wanted to have, since I made one as a boy, was a delicious looking gingerbread house at the very end of it. Well, it's beautiful. We have another call. Let's take that. What is your question today? What does it feel like to be a famous illustrator? What does it feel like to be a famous illustrator? Wow, that's a very good question. It feels pretty good. <laughs> I have to tell you though, it takes up a lot of my time because I'm very busy. Um, if I'm not out being on television talking to you here today, I have to be in my studio making books. So one of the things that's a little tough about being an author and illustrator is you're very, very busy. You spend a lot of time creating. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do, but you really have to plan out all of your days and your weeks worth of work in advance. So I'm a very good planner. I'm not so clean. My studio is a big mess, but I'm a good planner. 
Could you show us how to make another pop-up? I sure can. Let's make one more. All right. All right, so I'll take a piece of cardstock here. This one's going to be a little bit simpler than the earlier one, but since we were just talking about cookie count, I think we should make something delicious. Sounds so I'm going to fold yummy. this one into half, too. This pop-up is called a layer pop-up, and this is the easiest one that you can make. It doesn't matter what grade you're in. You can be K through 12, or you can be 99. doesn't make a difference. I fold my piece of cardstock in half, and I just draw two black lines like so. Now, they have to be pretty much about the same height, but if they're not perfect, it doesn't matter. You learn that it, you don't have to be perfect when you're making simple pop-ups. I cut along each edge, and then I fold the piece back, and I crease it with my finger and my thumb. Crease it really good. Remember, creasing it makes the fiber wiggly, which is what you want, because you need it wiggly. I open it up like a tent, like so. Push what was on the outside to the inside and close it shut, close it shut. You can see what was there before, it's gone now, totally gone to the inside. And you get the very beginnings of a layer pop-up. You get a layer pop-up. Now you can keep on going with this pop-up. I think it's starting to take an interesting shape. And if you wanted to, you can make it into a boat or a car or anything you want. So I'm going to make another layer. I'll make two more lines and we'll cut along the black lines. They're a little bit shorter this time. And I'll fold it back against itself again, increase it with my finger and my thumb, Put it back to where it was, open it up like a tent, push it through to the inside, I'll close it shut, and now you get a second layer coming up, a second layer coming up. Okay, so what can it be? Since I'm in a delicious mood, I think we should make this into a cake. I'll take my markers again, and we'll make a beautiful blue plate, like so, and we'll put some candles on it. My mother just celebrated her birthday, so this is going to be, I think, a nice little cake for her. If she's out there watching, happy birthday, Mom. Thanks for letting me make all those messes and not yelling at me too much. So we've got some candles, and now, of course, we have to have some icing. And you can make this any kind of cake you wanted. If you used a piece of brown construction paper, it could be a chocolate layer cake. That would be my favorite. Right. I love chocolate, too. For there an you average, go. Uh, for an average pop-up. How long would it take to, to really make one? Does it take a matter of days? It takes a matter of days. It mm -hmm. depends on how complex it is. Mm -hmm. um, if it's just got a few pieces of paper, maybe four or five pieces of paper, I'm faster now so I can do it in a few days. But if it's a pop-up that has many pieces mm -hmm. of paper, like 12 or 20 pieces of paper, mm -hmm. that can take me a week or even two weeks. And even that's not a guarantee it's going to work. So it's really a matter of how, how intricate, how much detail you're putting into this, that planning and then that trial and error That's we were exactly talking about That's exactly correct, earlier. yes. It can be really months. And when you make a pop-up book, the most difficult part really is the pop-ups themselves. Because I can sort of see in my mind what I want the artwork to look like, and I know what the story is going to be, but until I actually make the pop-up, there's no guarantee that it's going to work. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, thank you. Robert, I do think we are out of time, and this has just been fascinating. If you would like more information about Robert Sabuda, visit his website at www.robertsabuda.com. If you would like to learn more about this series, visit us at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network and click on Meet the Author. Thanks for joining us. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. All right, Robert, can you show me how to make sure. one more with this, this paper? You have one more piece of paper. Okay.